The voice of Sherry. Do you understand? Hi, this is your host Arlene Tan at Monday Morning Matters, where we discuss perspectives from Southeast Asia. Today, we are going to talk about the topic: Is Malaysia too clingy on cheap labours? Where we discuss on the market demand and rights of foreign workers. Malaysia is no stranger to foreign labours. Ever since we embarked on the economic path towards industrialisation, Malaysia has been opening its doors on an influx of foreign workers. Majority of them are unskilled workers from poor neighbouring countries. They usually would occupy 3D jobs that Malaysians won't do. Jobs that are dirty, dangerous, and demanding. Moreover, due to weak employment law and a system that lacks proper protection towards workers, they are also risk being abused by their employers and being looked down by locals. I will be speaking to Dr. On Kian Ming, a member of the Malaysian Opposition Party, Democratic Action Party, or short for DAP, and a member of Parliament for Serdang. He has been vocal against numerous government policies that are seen as detrimental to the nation and society. In this segment, he talks about how we can break the vicious cycle among Malaysians for our over reliance towards unskilled migrant workers. He will also discuss the way forward for Malaysia to be a high income nation. You are now listening to Monday Morning Matters. Monday Morning Matters Perspectives from, from Southeast, Southeast Asia. Asia Hi, this is Arlene. You are back with me again and with Dr. On Ken Ming, Opposition DAP member as well as a member of Parliament for Serdang. So the next focus will be on the demand of the unskilled labour in Malaysia. There seems to be an increase of such demand. And with that, uh, you have influx of illegal workers or illegal migrant workers coming into this country. But there seems to be a, a positive uh, a light to, uh, with the recent news that uh, the government would want to absorb the existing undocumented foreign workforce. What do you think about it? Okay, uh, so I, I think the, we need to understand that the undocumented or illegal migrant issue is actually quite complex. It is not uh, you know, so easily dichotomized, to say, uh, so, so easily described as undocumented work, workers coming into the country. Mm-hmm. I think many of the, the currently undocum- current uh, workers who are undocumented uh, were actually documented at one point in time. Uh, you know, they came in through the normal visa processes and whatnot. But because uh, you know, the, their, their passports or their visas are held or, be, or, or linked to just one employer. Uh, when they find that this particular employer has been abusing them, or if let's say they find that they can earn more in another uh, phase of employment, many of them would just uh, leave, their, leave their current jobs and then they will go and work somewhere else. And that's when they become undocumented. Right? So that's when they become illegal workers. And I think the, the estimates actually vary quite a bit. Uh, the, the official statistics give about uh, give us uh, tell us that there are about two million documented workers, uh, uh, legal foreign workers in this country. Uh, the estimates of the undocumented or illegal workers vary uh, from a low of about one uh, one million to about as high as four million. Right. So you know this is a big pool here. Mm, you know, yeah, this a lot. As it includes, for example, uh, many. Many uh, of those people in uh, Sabah, for example, who are, uh, you know, of varying uh, immigration status, uh, some of them don't have papers. Uh, many of them are considered uh, as illegal migrants, not even illegal uh, labor, illegal uh, migrants who are mm-hmm. coming from other parts of the country. And including uh, refugees. Of uh, uh, yes, but the number of uh, refugees in this country, uh, uh, you know, the official numbers at least are not that high, about 140 to 150,000 according to the latest statistics. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this would not include. Uh, you know, Malaysia doesn't recognize refu- uh, you know uh, illegal refugees, so I think that that's another you know, topic of, of discussion. Uh, but um, 
Yeah, so, you know, when we talk about undocumented workers, it's a very big pool. And I think uh, you would remember that there was a 6P program uh, that was uh, initiated by the oh, government yeah. back uh, a couple of years back. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, and the idea was, uh, of this program is actually to uh, legalize or document some of the undocumented workers. Uh, and I think as a result of that process, uh, about 500,000 uh, workers who were previously undocumented received their documentation and they were allowed to work uh, legally as, uh, as uh, documented workers. But uh, a number also were deported. Uh, but, you know, this 6P program wasn't effective in covering all of the undocumented workers. Plus, you have a situation whereby you have more and more, pe- more uh, migrants uh, changing their status from documented to undocumented because of the problems that I talked about just now. So even as you legalize some of them, uh, you know, that there, there is, uh, uh, you know, probably an equal or greater number becoming illegal, uh, you know, uh, during the, the, the same time. Mm-hmm. With such a diverse pool of uh, undocumented uh, workers, how can government uh, best uh, seek for solution for this area? Yeah, can you repeat the question? It wasn't clear. With so many uh, undocumented, undocumented workers out there with diverse reason why they are undocumented, how can the government address this uh, in a way that it, it uh, completely reduce the number of uh, illegal uh, people coming into Malaysia? Um, I, I, I don't really think that you can completely reduce, uh, completely get rid of this number. Uh, there will always be some people who fall through the cracks for whatever reason. Uh, but, uh, you know, I have a couple of suggestions on how the government can improve this process. Uh, number one, uh, you know, there has got to be a better system for allowing foreign workers to, uh, you know, continue their stay in this country legally. So, for example, uh, if let's say, you know, you are tied to this employer for two years, after the two years, uh, you know, there has got to be a process whereby you can renew your your your, your work permit, so to speak, uh, within this country, and you are, should be allowed to change jobs uh, if, let's say, you want to. Uh, you know, so this would decrease the number of uh, you know, undocumented workers. Uh, and I think that the, there's also another important thing about this documentation process, which is, uh, you know, if, let's say, more workers are allowed to be unionized and, and they have more rights, there would be more, uh, there would be more uh, workers who, you know, once they know that, uh, they will have their proper rights if they are documented. They will be incentivized to do so. Right? They will get higher wages. They will have protections, let's say, from, from uh, people who are always asking them for their documentation papers and whatnot. And, and I also want to stress that, uh, you know, once uh, foreign workers have, have more of these uh, union rights and, and other bargaining powers, they will naturally in, uh, ask for more wages. Mm-hmm. And I think indirectly, this would actually decrease the demand for foreign workers if, let's say, you know, their wages uh, are, are pushed up to a point whereby, you know, uh, the, the, the local workers are willing to work in some of these uh, areas. So I think that we need to monitor this situation very closely to see whether some of these, uh, you know, knock-on effects uh, that I hope will, will come as a result of more rights being given to foreign workers would, would, be, uh, would be felt in the country. I see. And uh, another area that is also uh, concerned by a lot of Malaysian is the fact that they are scared that more foreign workers means more social problems, more crimes. Do you think there's a sense of xenophobic uh, uh, attitude towards migrant workers by the locals? There's uh, an increased yeah. sense? I, I think generally that there's a very negative attitude that Malaysians, take, Malaysians have towards uh, foreign workers in this country. Uh, you know, using the rugged three terms and so looking looking down on them and, and abusing them. You know, we saw uh, a tape of, uh, you know, a famous blogger in Malaysia called Papa Gomo basically, uh, you know, uh, hitting a foreign worker and having very little respect for, 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 for these people. Uh, and that, I think, easily translates into a larger xenophobic kind of uh, sentiment. This is not something that's unique to Malaysia. I think many other countries also, you know, have these kinds of... Uh, uh, fears and I think many irrational fears towards foreign workers. But I would like to emphasize uh, the the impression that somehow foreign workers are the cause of crime in Malaysia. I think is something that's not accurate because if we think about it, we actually have about you know anywhere between two to six million foreign workers in this country. If only a small number of them, even if let's say you know one uh, percent uh, of them are involved in uh, in uh, you know crime, uh, that's very obvious. Uh, we would definitely feel 
it much more than we are feeling now. Uh, I would say that foreign workers, uh, most of them, a large majority of them, are actually much more afraid of uh, you know the police uh, and even of uh, of uh, you know committing crimes mm-hmm. uh, compared to the average Malaysian because uh, you know they are in a position whereby they are, they are, they have very little rights in this country. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So I think this is something that we need to take the you know into proper perspective. Yeah. So my final question is: If we really want to address on uh, our reliance of cheap labor, what can we do on the policy side as well as the advocacy side? Okay. I, I think uh, firstly, the government, uh, you know, the government has some tar- has some sort of like conditions now in terms of. Uh, how many foreign labor uh, each ca- each sector can recruit? Uh, these are overall targets, mm-hmm. uh, but these targets, as far as I know, are not published explicitly. Uh, they are not, uh, as far as I know, not grounded on any economic studies on how uh, these various sectors, like construction and farm oil and uh, plantation and whatnot, uh, you know, uh, actually need in terms of economic requirement. But why uh, is that so? Why why is this happening? Well, I think there's a lack of transparency in the government. Uh, on the whole, and perhaps there's a lack of capability or capacity to want to make this kind of, uh, uh, you know, economic studies. And I also think that uh, there is an incentive for the government uh, not to want to reduce foreign labor uh, because of the commercial considerations that I talked about just now. Uh, the fact that the government actually gets revenue uh, from foreign workers levy and other processing fees, and also many intermediaries, some of whom may be connected to some uh, politicians or some political parties can uh, you know, reap a lot of benefit mm-hmm. uh, by bringing in foreign workers in this country. So we actually need to bite the bullet. We need to uh, set uh, targets whereby we uh, slowly decrease uh, the number of foreign workers who are coming into this country. I'm not advocating for a policy whereby we just stop foreign workers coming into this country right now uh, and, and go to zero. But we need to try to slowly reduce it over time and to try to tailor it mm-hmm. according to real market conditions. Uh, and we can look at perhaps some of the practices that uh, our neighbour Singapore has, has done over the years in terms of having a much more flexible strategy in, in adjusting to foreign workers. And also at a, at a time when there are domestic pressures in, in their country to reduce dependency on foreign workers, they have done many uh, they've taken many concrete steps in order to reduce the number of foreign workers coming into this country. So mm-hmm. we can also learn from that. Mm-hmm. We need to allow for wages in this country to increase uh, as a way to increase, uh, incentivize more Malaysians to take up some of these jobs that are considered too uh, dangerous but, uh, or, or dirty or whatnot. But I actually do think that Malaysians are willing to take them up. Uh, if the, 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 the wages but, are right. But I want, I want to stop you from uh, stop you there because uh, there's a lot of uh, criticism against having uh, an increased uh, minimum wage. Why, that, why is that so? Well, I, I think the criticism is coming from the, uh, many of the employers uh, because obviously it will hit them at the bottom line. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, there, there's also an excuse which says that uh, some of these additional costs will be passed down to the to the consumer. Uh, I, I think those criticisms will always th- those kinds of uh, uh, you know pushback from the from the uh, private sector will always be there. But uh, at the end of the day, the government needs to think about the, the the larger picture, the more holistic picture of whether it wants Malaysia to move into a high income economy or whether it wants Malaysia to continue to focus on the low end industries. Uh, which uh, you know are actually which give actually a, a low paying jobs, especially if let's say productivity is not increased in these industries. Mm-hmm. And uh, finally, on the advocacy side, do you think that we need you know greater awareness on uh, the importance of being aware of the plight and issues uh, that foreign workers are facing? Uh, yes, definitely, and I think we need to look at the you know the plight of the foreign workers in various sectors, uh, in manufacturing, in retail, in uh, in uh, plantations, you know, and and, and uh, in uh, among the domestic uh, helpers, the maids and whatnot. Uh, and I think this is something that we need to to do if let's say we want to move into uh, you know a country that's more progressive, uh, that's more you know that's developed not just economically but also from the perspective of human rights. Uh, it's going to be a long road, uh, but you know we need to do it. And and I think the 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 key part here is actually to convince Malaysians why is it in their interest uh, to look after or to increase the rights of the foreign workers. Uh, 
Uh, and I think one of the examples I gave just now is uh, valid uh, in the sense that if the foreign workers have more rights, they would demand for higher wages. Uh, and these higher wages actually would also help uh, raise the overall wages uh, among uh, Malaysian workers as well. Mm-hmm. With that, thank you very much, Ong Kam Ning. Uh, thank you for, for, for having me uh, uh, to talk about this very important issue. Monday Morning Matters Perspectives from, from Southeast, Southeast Asia, Asia. For more interviews by Durian ASEAN, please tune in to our website at durianasean.com. If you are on the go, you can always download our tune-in app on your mobile. Please subscribe to our YouTube channels at Durian ASEAN and Durian ASEAN TV. Don't forget to follow us on our Facebook page, Twitter and Instagram. We always welcome feedback from our listeners. Stay tuned with Monday Morning Matters on Monday, same time at 10 to 11 a.m. on GMT Plus 8. Durian ASEAN the voice of discovery and sharing. You're now listening to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing.